Would you rather shoot a 200 inch typical or a 196 trashy motherfucker? Typical. Every time. Interesting. Yeah. I'm a little trashy. I'd, I'd, I'd rather shoot f- a 190 typical than a, than oh, a 200 inch trashy. Trashy fucker every time. Yeah. I've got, I don't know. I got enough little trashy cheater bucks. I like clean typicals. I, I thought you'd go the other way, Joni. No. Really thought you would. Welcome to the Shoot to Hunt podcast with your host, Ryan Avery, a registered Democrat who loves the 6'5 Creedmoor, and the Jacob Moshani. His beard is made of the gypsy pubes. But together, they make the number four podcast in all of the US and a a great success. It is a nice. Did you meet Luke when he came when you came in last time? Uh, the other day, Luke, the marketing guy. No, I didn't. Oh, he wasn't here for he wasn't here yesterday. Oh I, yeah, I love the Borat intro. Yeah, yeah, that's him. That's special. He, he is he special. Is. He's fucking special. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Luke is very special. He just come up. We we. I said because I already heard his Borat voice. So I said, Luke, we're gonna go sit in the fucking room, dude. We're gonna record an intro. So I said it's gonna be on the fly. You know, no fucking writing down script and shit. And yeah. The, the fucking gypsy pubes and shit and the 6.5 crate just flowed out of them. Well, he forgot that they're the number one exporter of potassiums. <laughs> <laughs> I, until I met Luke, I had never seen it. And these two were giving me a bunch of shit. And uh, my son came back and he was on leave. So we watched it. And my wife's like 10 minutes in. She goes, this is fucking ridiculous. And yeah. she walked out. Yeah. Me and my son loved it. Yeah. Guy humor. It's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah, you got it. It's a unique. It's like... Will Ferrell humor is just a different level of humor. You got to like it. I like it or hate it. I like it. I like fucking kind of morbid, dark humor. Yeah. Mm. Idiocracy is probably my favorite movie. So it's, it's right in that, that same one. cat. You haven't seen that one? Who's in that? Uh, is it uh, Owen Wilson? I've never heard of it. It's one of the best movies ever. Oh, I do like Owen Wilson. Yeah. For those of you guys that don't know, we have Dione Amucha Staggy in the house. Yep. Dione, thanks for uh, waiting, you know, last minute. It, it worked out. 24 hours or less, invitation. Have to put the kids down before you come. Yeah. And your whirlwind tour to North Idaho. Yeah, we're up here on vacation with the family, and I was giving Ryan a hard time, and he asked me to do a podcast. And told Dude, it's good, but if I could come after the kids go to bed, we can we can have some fun. Luke Wilson, Terry Crews, Andrew Wilson, Dak Shepard. Yeah, Terry Crews David is David Herman. Okay. And it's hilarious. Dude, we got that right. Terry, the ma- the muscly black yeah. dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's hilarious. Yeah, he's uh, so not not to not to ruin it for you, but he's uh, he's actually a professional wrestler and porn star, oh, and he shit. becomes the president. And you're like three thousand, and everybody's everybody's dumber in society at that point. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he gets uh, was it Luke Wilson or Owen Wilson? Uh, Owen, yeah. Okay, yeah, whichever Wilson. He uh, he gets frozen as an experiment in the army and wakes up like a thousand years later, and everybody's basically dumb, like just dumb. retarded. <laughs> Oh, man. And that he's the smartest like, man on the planet at that point. Sounds like the president of Ukraine. I wrote it down. We're going to watch it's it. It's pretty good. All right, Dione. We have a, f- a few questions for you. Okay. I've had you on a podcast. What, this is the four- third time, fourth time? Three or four. Three or four. Something like that. I believe we were your first I think so. podcast. Yeah. You came a long ways because now you're like a... No, no, I don't choke on my tongue the whole time. <laughs> no, now you're like a, you're like a fucking celebrity. I, I was going to ask you this question. I was kind of put you on the... On the uh, kind of the blast is, what's up with you on and off, on and off with your Instagram page? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, I It feels like a big waste of time sometimes, and I catch myself. What's your Instagram? Uh, Call it out. Uh, wild Idaho. Wild underscore Idaho. Uh, wild lower hashy. <laughs> lower hashy. Nice. Idaho. <laughs> Idaho. There we go. Um, wild Idaho. I don't know. I catch myself not, not being present enough, paying attention to my kids. Gotcha. You know, being you know, active, involved, home. It's like, I just need to turn this thing off for a while. And then I get, you know, hit a stretch where I'm bored and turn it back on. Well, you have some very entertaining posts. I try to. Well, we're and following you, you now. You July some... 6th was your last post. Yep. Then June 30th, June 28th. That's not bad. I was June doing like 27th. one a year for a while. You do? Oh, I look, read, read his Gandhi post. Too. You can see it. It's, it's not very far down. It <laughs> oh, I see right up. there. Kill something every day. It keeps you sharp. I've been saying it for years. But it says Gandhi, I probably, or something like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, Gandhi probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cracks yeah me he up. might have said something like that. <sighs> you know, you never know. He could have. <laughs> Check him out, Dione Wild underscore Idaho Instagram. Yeah, don't try to spell that last name. Yep. We've talked about this before, and that's I, I named you on Rockslide. 
Yeah. The Basque Assassin. Basque Assassin. Oh, it works. Goodness. Say your last name. Amuchastegui. It's standard uh, spelling. Much, uh, standard. <laughs> oh, when you say it, it, it looks good. It's phonetically I, I, correct. I had to yeah. practice. My that. wife teaches first graders how to say it, so nice. you Does can't she? get it. It's yeah, it's a bad look. It, I'll just say you, Mrs. A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at it, it looks pretty daunting, but it's actually yeah. mucha staggy. It's There's nice. A bunch of letters in there. Nice. Yeah, how often when you were growing up did they fuck that Dude, up? Dude, kindergarten was rough. Put it that way. Learning <laughs> to spell that thing. <laughs> <laughs> What's the lineage on that? Where, where's it from? I'm Basque. Basque. Yep. They're some of the toughest people ever existed. Yeah. Is the country called Basque? No, no. Uh, so we, we don't have a country, but we're from the north of Spain on the on the border with France. Okay. So, so is it the name of a town? Like, what is the what is the word so Basque? It's, come it's from? a it's an ethnically ethnically unique group of people. We're okay. not Spanish. We're not French. Uh, we just don't have a country. So wow. Yeah, if you read their lineage, they uh they got in some they got in some fights. Yeah, we're one of the few places that didn't get overtaken by rome when they came through spain okay it's pretty uh geographically isolated the pyrenees mountains surround the basque country so uh yeah that's it's, cool. uh, it's probably one of the oldest languages in europe too it's huh. a totally unique language yeah i mean on rockside you can have your name and then you can have your username then you can have like a little name but like i'm an administrator underneath mine uh -huh. well you can change it so i went through everybody was changing shit i was like I'm going to put Basque Assassin on. Nice. <laughs> How long did it take you to notice? Uh, I don't know. I spend a lot more time on Rock Slide than I do on Instagram. I think I noticed it that day. Is Great. it B-A-S-K or B-A-S-Q-U-E? B -A -S -Q -U -E. Okay. Mm -hmm. nice. Basque. Yeah. Nice. All right. We're going to, it's going to be a sensitive subject for you, Dione, but we're going to have to breach, we're going to have to broach the subject. You, you have done the death hike, the exo death hike. Yep. Can you kind of take us through the previous and then the one that you yeah, so I think I think this year this year was year number seven, and we've uh, well, it was year number seven for me doing them. Uh, you know, we basically usually we hike a whole mountain range. So like the first one I did, we did the entire Seven Devils range in a day. Well, four of us finished in a day. It was like thirty eight point eight miles. Uh, it was oh. actually me, your buddy Lampers. Mark Holsing uh, works for XO. Thirty-eight point eight miles. Yeah, but but the big butt in there is what was the fucking vertical? I don't know. It was a lot. That was before I was tracking anything. Oh, had had to be like fifteen thousand feet. It, probably you had me at thirty-eight. Yeah. Probably, and it's fucking. It could be thirty-eight so downhill. <laughs> <laughs> four with, of us finished with that the one. mountain bike. Holy shit! Four of us finished that one straight through, uh, and the rest of everybody else stayed stayed in the bottom, spent the night, and then hiked up over the next day. Well, that kind of made Steve Steve uh, Speck, the owner of Exo Mountain Gear, he didn't like that we finished it in a day. So the next year, he set one up that was a hundred miles. And we did it in basically two and a half days. We did the entire uh, Boulder White Cloud range. We started north of Stanley, and then we hiked the whole range to the south and came out south of Ketchum. Well, this can't be like on trails and shit. Then, if you're just picking a range and going, you're probably off trail. A lot, lot of huh? on trail. Uh, that one was that one was mostly on trail. We had a few sections where you know go a few miles here and there to connect back to other trails, but it's basically just zigzagging through the mountain mm -hmm. range. Um, yeah, and then we you know we've, they've been all over. We got flown into the Frank one year and snowshoed out. Uh, last year we went up to Alaska and we got dropped off and, uh, or well, we took off from a spot and then we did a big loop trail. Um, and then this year Steve was busy putting out the K4 and, uh, he'd asked me and my buddy Dan Solzman if we could, if we could plan the route. And, uh, Dan and I, I can't remember which one of us originated with it, but it was something we were both thinking about. There's uh, a route, it's called, I think it's called the FKT route where guys run, there's seven peaks over 12,000 feet. That's the, on the Bora the Lost River Range. Yep, through okay. the Lost River Range. So I've seen that. The trail. plan this year, we got we got an actual person's race route. Uh, Cody Lind, he's he's a professional runner, super nice guy. We actually happened to run into him up there. And he sent us his actual route for doing that. And then we took a chunk of that route and then added thirty five miles of trail running on top of it well we cut we cut a chunk off so we didn't do his whole route because he he hits all seven of the twelve thousand foot peaks we had three of the twelve thousand foot peaks and then we added a 35 mile trail run to it so we were going to try and do it straight through no sleep so like steve's only request this year with us for planning this route was he wanted us to make it so hard that not everybody was able to finish uh-huh so <laughs> sounds like he succeeded he over <laughs> well we overachieved because i i didn't finish steve didn't finish <laughs> almost nobody finished um well, yeah, it was it was rough, and and the real embarrassing part for me as as a guy who didn't finish it is I've known the route for six months, 
So I knew there was going to be some semi-technical rock climbing going through this thing. And, and, you know, I trained really hard. I feel like I'm in the best shape of my life right now. And, and I could, I could flat hike for days, but, uh, I knew what was on this course and I didn't prepare for it. So there's none of it's like crazy technical, hard rock climbing, but it's pretty exposed and I'm not good with heights. So I got up onto the first pretty exposed spot and just locked up and I was, I was shaking pretty bad. And, uh, just, you know, in that moment, I realized I, I got to get off of this thing because it's really big consequences if you fall. Oh, dude, being the, the heights thing's a real fear. Yeah. You know, you like I am not scared of heights in the Army. I've done a lot of things with a lot of heights. But one thing I am, if you fucking try to put me in a fucking tube, dude, uh uh-uh. I'm claustrophobic as hell. <laughs> and I've seen that fear out of me. With claustrophobia. Yeah, and I've been able to work through it with most stuff before, but I wasn't I was in a little bit of a bad headspace going into it. I you know, it really minor, but had you know, kind of screwed myself up the week before training and uh, was just gonna try and push through it. But you know, I was in a bad headspace going into it. I got to that spot and just locked up, turned around, like, nope. <laughs> so what were the what were the specs of this hike? So you said it was seventy it was uh, it's get, it's it's hard because like when you when you map something out you never actually get the the real distance because mm-hmm. you you know the the trails are you know optimistic at best. Mm-hmm. So you end up zigzagging a lot trying to refine trails, uh, but we figured it was going to end up between fifty and fifty five miles, twenty thousand feet of vertical, <sighs> and we were going to do it straight through no sleep. Oh, we weren't even letting people take a sleeping bag. How many people started? Wow. How many finished? So that's the other funny part. We started with 28 people that committed to doing the hike in the week before. I mean, a, bunch, a few people quit before that, but in the week before we dropped down to 13. So 13 of us started the hike. Two guys finished it. You guys had half casualties before you started. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, you know, it's hard to it's hard to read into what everybody's reasoning was, but I have to imagine the route played a part. <laughs> well, 50, 55 miles. If you had planned on going straight through, how long do you think that would have taken you if things worked out? So, if best case scenario, we were thinking twenty four, more reasonable thirty six. Okay. And and, and Dan, uh, my buddy who helped plan the route, finished in thirty five hours. Okay. And he probably would have done it faster, but he was hanging with some other people. So we want to kind of, you know, be a little bit safe. So we try and keep people together. And that dude's an animal. He could have. So how many finished? He could have smoked it out in a few a few hours less than that. I think. Yeah. Two guys finished. Two guys finished. Yep. Him and another guy named Justin Clement. Super you said good. you're in the best shape of your life right now, and I imagine you've been in good shape for a while. You're pretty stout, dude, and yeah. you've been you know training for all the other death hikes that you've done. Like what? What is a weekly training regiment, you know, leading up to this that you were doing? So I've, I've been working out pretty much five to seven days a week for the last six months, and I've been trying to do zone two cardio. So no, really, I yeah, I've never been a good runner, but That's like hard. it's it's not really like it's it's way way easier. No, time wise, it's hard. Time wise, it's a big yes. commitment. So you know, I get up five thirty to six every day, go work ten hours, come home, spend time with the wife and kids, get the kids down. You know, about eight o'clock, I got them asleep, and then I take off and go work out for an hour and a half, two hours every night. But I've been, you know, the, the zone two is really nice because it, it gives you, you know, you, you're not destroying yourself, so you get good recovery. Mm-mm. So if you if you keep in that, when like, you say zone two cardio, you mean like heart rate zone? Heart rate mm-hmm. zone. Okay. Yeah. So for me, it's between like one thirty five, one forty five. So and those are like two hours of basically you can talk while you're walking, kind of. That's what yep. you're trying to hit. Yep. Yeah. And and for me, basically, I'd get there. I'd stretch, um, kind of loosen up, get on either the treadmill and set it to like 30 degree incline and then just go at whatever speed I could to maintain that heart rate, just modulating the speed to stay in that heart rate zone or I get on the stair climber or I'm running laps. And what was that time period? How long was that workout? Hour to hour and a half. You're not lifting heavy weights at all. You're just doing cardio. I've been lifting one day a week for the last six months. Okay. And, and when you lift, what's your focus, your area? Just all over, I, full I'm body, jacked up, kind of everywhere. I got a bad shoulder, got bad back in a few places. <laughs> I'm just, okay. I fucking do, feel you. Do the stuff that doesn't hurt. It might have something to do with the death hikes for seven years. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, it's all all the stuff. <laughs> yeah. All the stuff that hurts has nothing to do with that. Oh yeah. Well, I got an ankle that's bad from the hundred miler. It clicks every time I spin it around, but I, oh. I sprained it three times on day two. Oh. Okay, t- take this year out of it. Yeah. What has been the hardest part mentally? In those death hikes, 
physically I know you're there, but mentally I I remember you telling me one time you maybe first or second you're yeah. like really sucking, and then something happened. The or first something. ones were hard, but the, they were hard for for more reasons than the physicality of it. So like diet's ridiculous how big of a part it plays, mm. and uh, and I was doing everything wrong for the first few years. Like the hundred miler, I ate maybe only 3000 calories over three days. I was sick. I was sick, sick going through that puking diarrhea, not in good shape, but just sheer willpower through it. Um, we've worked a lot with Kyle camp who owns Valley to peak nutrition, and he's got everybody dialed in. It's, it's so, it's so ridiculously easier now that we have like good diet advice um, that, you mean the diet during the exercise during, or leading during, up to it? Yeah, no, right. not I. I did very little of the stuff he suggested leading up to it, uh-huh. but during, basically, if if you're if you're replacing carbohydrates as fast as you're burning them, you're not damaging muscle. Okay, not nearly to the extent that you would if you're not replacing carbohydrates. It's a lot of so liquid sugar, or basically just sucking down tang, tailwind, gummy bears, gummy, bears. gummy worms, flour tortillas. Like that was my diet. I had. For for this year, I had like ninety five hundred, maybe ten thousand calories of basically sugar and one peak refuel. Okay. And you have, you were telling me at one point in time you used to like eat nothing but like uh, Slim Jims. Like you had, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You had no, like, I I'd eat uh, I'd eat pepperoni sticks like they're going out of style. I called them diesel sticks. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, but when it depends on your output. So if you're if you're like low output, you can eat that kind of stuff because mm-hmm. you have. You have the body resource, like you, you can redirect that blood to your stomach to digest that food and you'll feel well. But when you're going really hard nonstop for 14 to you know however many hours a day, you just can't dedicate the resources to digestion, which is why the sugar is so easy because like it just it's so easy for your stomach to process that you get the energy almost immediately from it. Um, it's not it's not a, a, a tax on your system like heavier foods are. So like if you're trying to eat protein bars while you're going hard on a hike, you're going to get a gut ache huh. and it's going to make you crash. Were you trying to keep yourself in that zone too during the, what, so what, if you where stay, you trained? If you stay below that, yeah. I mean, ideally you want to stay below that because that's where you're going to be able to do the most work. Okay. <laughs> Damn. Man. When we do can fit, so we, we don't do nothing like you're doing. I don't mm. do nothing like you're doing. But we uh, we, we hiked Canfield a little bit, getting prepared for the Selway hike. Mm-hmm. And we would time each other to the top. So it's it's 1,800 feet to the top in 1.8 miles. Correct. About that, right, Ryan? Yep. Uh, so if we ba- we basically say if you could do that in under an hour, mm-hmm. then you're in decent enough shape it's to go elk good. hunting. Yeah. So I was doing it in 56 minutes with 50 pounds on my back. Solid. So I felt pretty freaking, you know, I was feeling pretty good. But I don't think, when I think about what you did... I mean that's a that's a whole nother level, but we're not we're not fueling that way. I don't I didn't watch like my heart rate was getting to one eighty. Like mm-hmm. I'm I'm up there. Like See, I'm pushing as hard as I can to get there. That's the the thing of it is is like you want to get yourself to where you can do that level of effort with a lower heart rate because yeah. then you can sustain it. He's a lot yeah. lower heart rate than I am. Yeah, like if you're you've seen the uphill athlete, mm-hmm. listen to them. Yeah, that's basically what I you know yeah. all, all of my friends are doing the uphill athlete. And I'm like, hey, what, what you doing this week? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, one of my buddies had a train. Well, Anthony, the friend yeah, that yeah, you, the you chi- ran into in the dude. middle of nowhere. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he, he had, he hired a trainer for this from uphill athlete. He had like a personal trainer. Did he, from what, up, did he do it? Oh yeah. He well, didn't he didn't it. finish either. <laughs> he, he actually did it. He, so he, he was so angry cause he, he got past the spot I got scared at and got to another spot and watched some guys. He watched Steve and Dan and, uh, and a couple other guys going over Mount Idaho. And he's like. That's not happening. <laughs> it was sketchy. It was super, super sketchy. But he was so mad because he he trained. He he was in as good a shape of anybody. Like it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't a like how fit are you to be able to do this? Like the the, the thing that made everybody quit was everybody was scared for their life. But, uh, so most people um, fell out because of the height climbing rock shit. Yeah, because it was sketchy and they weren't comfortable. But gotcha. he he was so mad about how the whole thing went down that he actually just finished a fifty mile trail run today. <laughs> he signed up. It was fifty two miles. It was uh it was some some ultra they had in McCall today. You're kidding me. No, he he just like I was couldn't let it go. Literally, he's a guy. I had to turn my phone on silent for so I wouldn't get. So what is this right uphill now. athlete? I don't um, know that much about it, but I know they do. They're mountain climbers. Mountain climbers, yeah, like big time mountain climbers. Everest, like you know, like 
not only that, they rock, I believe they rock climb, but there's, they have a podcast called the uphill athlete. Yeah. Okay. They train people for mountaineering. Yep. And they okay. talk about zone one, zone two, zone three. And they, they literally, why I knew about zone two is like a couple of years ago I was doing it is most people don't train for that. And they try to just blow their hearts out. And they're like, if you train at zone two long enough, that naturally lowers your heart rate down and you have, you're putting out just as much effort like he's talking about but your body's used to it and it doesn't spike your freaking heart rate. Well, when you're running up that mountain at 180 beats a minute, mm-hmm. you're not expanding your cardiovascular capability. Really? Like you're you're doing a physical muscle workout. Mm-hmm. You're not getting a cardio workout. But if you stay in that zone 2, and the the biggest thing with zone 2 or like as I understand it, I'm not an expert on this, but the biggest thing that I got from it is that you want to do the most volume of work. And if you want to do that, you have to be in zone 2 because if you're above that, you're doing a muscle workout. You're not doing a cardio workout. Is zone so, two different for everybody? Is it based on age or what is it based, based on? Based on age and, and physical the two condition. There's a, minus your age there's a thing. test for it, and it's really yeah. a pain in the ass. Okay. Yeah, but, I guesstimated. I called up Kyle Camp, and I'm like, hey, Kyle, I, I what do you think my zone two is at? <laughs> I guesstimated, too. Because the thing that is, nobody wants to fucking do zone two because it takes forever. It takes. Yeah. But here's the yeah. crazy thing. I feel so good. Every single day, like just my general sense of wellness, how good I feel day in and day out has gotten exponentially better through this. And I've taken a picture of every single workout I did. So like I take a picture of the display on the treadmill at the end of the workout and where I started to where I'm at now. So I started for me for an hour. I could do 2.2 miles an hour at 22 degrees on. we got a wicked nice treadmill at my gym and it goes up to 30. So so I could maintain that for an hour. 22 degrees, 2.2 miles an hour. Now I can do 30 degrees at 2.7 miles an hour, same heart rate. Hmm. Hmm. Way I, steeper, way faster. Mm-hmm. Did you like did you lose body weight? Did you change I mean did change anything, you know, like in your I body? I stayed the same weight. I did didn't you? lose any weight. Maybe it shifted but I've lost around some, a little bit. I lost a bunch of fat. Gotcha. He's not really a chunky guy. Well, no, but he, when I when I'm, be frank with you, I'm fucking not a set of car. I'm a fat fucker. But you were a bigger dude when I saw you at the expo. This is close to the heaviest. Well, I was a fatter dude. Yeah. Like, I, was I mean, a you're, fatter you're dude. physically fit now. You yeah. were a little fluffier yeah, when I, I saw you. Yeah, I haven't. I've, I've put on muscle. Yeah. I've lost fat, which I was not expecting. I was expecting because I've been running a lot too. And I'm like, well, all the guys that run are all skinny. And I definitely haven't got skinny. Mm-hmm. No, so. but it's moved mm. around. Yeah. Look good. Look good. What about your normal diet? You know, during the time that you're yeah. training, I mean, you're, you're protein heavy, <laughs> McDonald's, whatever it takes. <laughs> he, fucking t- he, has his sh- he always tells me, all oh, my diet's fucking garbage. Okay. It's not good. How old it's are you? It's not good. I'm 34. Okay. 34 and fucking sl- slapping mule deer. Let's talk, before we jump into mule deer, when I first met you, no kids. No kids. Married, no kids. Yeah. Now you got two kids in. How has that changed your hunting? It's a lot harder. <laughs> it's a lot harder. But... I gotta say, everybody told me like, "Yeah, your your days of killing big bucks are over." The year my daughter was born, I killed three three big bucks, <laughs> like two two pretty impressive deer and one that's still most people would be pretty tickled to shoot. And every year since then, I'm been I don't know. It's it, there's there's a, a fat piece of luck that goes with it mm-hmm. too, so I can't deny that. But I've been able to manage. People always ask my wife, and how how uh, how do you or how does it? Men always ask my wife. How do you let Ryan go hunting so much? So do you have any like let? That's the key word, let. So how do you work for, that out for with one your wife? thing? My wife's a first grade teacher and she's incredibly patient. <laughs> which which is a godsend. Because she has and three children. She has three children. Yep. The the two that came <laughs> from her and the one she married. Uh-huh. And uh a lot of credit goes to her because she still lets lets me get out a lot. But uh, part of it was I set the bar pretty low when we were dating. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pretty root for approve it. <laughs> she, for, for, for the longest time while we were dating, she thought I was seeing other girls on the weekend. <laughs> oh, shit. But uh, no, I... Uh, How you old know, are you kids? Uh, three and five. Boy and girl? Yep. Okay. Yep. So I uh, I hunted a lot when, when we were dating. I hunted a lot before I met her. And that was kind of the expectation. So, what's like the key, I guess, to keeping her happy? Because you know you're going to be gone all. Man, time. I haven't figured that out yet. No? <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I have either. I mean, I guess I don't leave them in dire straits. That's I try I really know. hard. I'm not. I'm not the best at any of it, but I do try really hard. I, you know, for whatever the, it's worth. But the bills are paid. The food's in the fridge. Yeah. I think the way to make that work is you basically you have to be good the whole rest of the year. 
to try. You I gotta do that's all why the shit you need to do. What is, the trust has to be there. Every, everything's gotta be mean? there. Huh? What does good mean? I though? mean, you gotta be good, okay? So you're not, you know, you're you do the hubby do's when you need to, you put in extra effort. So I do I do cooking, I I go buy the groceries, you know. Obviously it's a lot different from so my wife works here, right? So mm-hmm. we've been we've been doing business now together for four years. She's been working here the whole time. So we work together like twenty four seven. So it's actually I'll tell her to get the fuck out of the house. Like go do something with your girlfriends or something like yeah. that. So it's kind of similar. Maybe she's she's ready to be but before that, you know, I had a travel job and and me and May, so I started backpacking with my boy when he was four. So you're pretty close, all right? Your boy's three, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I started backpacking with him when he was four, and that kind of led into he's a pretty fucking he's a pretty strong hiker and killer. Well, hell, sounds like he's a well-rounded kid. I came in here the other, well, was it yesterday? Yeah. yeah. You got him working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's on That's summer awesome, break man. right now, and he wants to work and he's earn money. Negotiating. But- Hourly wage too. <laughs> so I get, so I get, you know, he knows what he's worth. He was trying to negotiate too good. for a fucking percentage of the business. Is what he was doing. He's like, I don't want to get. I want a percentage, Dad. I was yeah. like, what? What are you talking about? But you get hundred percent when I die. No shit. <laughs> Zero saying, till then. Just based. I mean, if you try to do, if you try to do your best in the off season yeah. to keep the misses happy, it helps when it's time. I to do go. try, and like I, you know, I don't, I don't take any money from my paycheck for hunting. Uh. So I. I do side work to to fund all that, and it's like I don't I don't take anything from my family for any of my toys. Nice, always wheeling and dealing. I see you selling shit on Rockstar. Yeah, a little bit of that. <laughs> so, what do you do on the side? Uh, well, I've done. I used to do a lot of electrical work. I've done some wheeling and dealing, just you know, whatever whatever I think I can make a buck at. But a lot and of you, it. And now you are is, a rifle guy, right? Not an archery guy. I'm a rifle guy. Okay. Nice. Yeah, I hunt a bow. I hunt with a bow when I have to. If I can't get a tag any other way, that's uh-huh. last. Last, right. last, last resort, but it's been a lot of years since I've hunted with a bow. Okay. I don't blame you. And yeah. the current... I like killing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Not scaring them. You don't like bow hiking? I don't like bow hiking. <laughs> What's your current rifle setup that you're going to hunt with this year? Uh, well, I've, for the last few years, I've hunted with an Altera Arm 6.5 PRC. If, if I can get it... Why are you laughing, Ryan? <laughs> because he is... We have had discussions about... He's... Rock Slide has changed his mind... Well, I should say Forum has changed his mind on things. Well, I don't know about that because I've been shooting the PRC for... Scope-wise. Scope-wise, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's... Yeah, I drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> so anyways, go, go through what you started with and what you're using today. Uh, so for, for a few years now, I've been shooting Altera Arms 6.5 PRC. It's been a great rifle. I've killed a pile of stuff with that thing. And then I've played musicals. I've bought like 20 scopes in the last year and a half. <laughs> Ever since he started chucking scopes on the ground... Um, I've bought pretty much everything he's tested <laughs> and uh, tried a lot of it for myself. Um, right now, I'm planning on, I'm building the 7 PRC currently, and I'm planning on using a 5 to 20 SWFA on it. What do you mean you're building the 7 PRC? Yeah, so I'm going to be using, uh, I've got an Altera stock. I really like those. They got a, a negative comb. Is that the new one you're talking about they just sold the shit out of? Yeah, no, they have a Tika one and they have a brand new one. Yeah, so this is the Tika one. Ton of tikas. Yeah, oh, okay, this is the okay. Tika one. Uh-huh. Although Drew raised the price, what the fuck? He raised well, so he did and he didn't. The dip that they were using on those was real expensive to do. He brought the price back down and is now offering it without that dip. Oh, he did. Yep. Well, I'm pretty sure. Bad thing I said about him. Pretty sure. Ago. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't listen to that one. <laughs> yeah, you can take that back. Um, so yeah, mine's just a straight carbon. Um, but yeah, I like that. It recoils straight back. You don't get as much muzzle rise. Easier spot impacts. And are you going to cut down a fucking another I'll break cut up there? <laughs> what are you, you going to do there? Uh, so I was you know, we have two ports, three ports, four, all the you sizes. You didn't have a two port tiny when I cut it up with a grinder. We do now. <laughs> you do now. We do now. <laughs> uh, I was telling Jake a little bit ago about a gun that I cut up a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and a break. And a break mm-hmm. that I cut up a lot. And Ryan thought it was pretty funny. But yeah, I'm putting it in Altera stock. Um SWFA 5 to 20. I'm going to be using the new Unknown Munitions rings and level. Oh, wow. Excited about those. UM Tika rings, baby. Yeah. Um, and then I'm putting, I actually, I was bugging Ken a bunch, and we we figured out that the uh, his his lever action three-port break, I like the port design on that. It's got the same uh, port design as the, the chub, mm-hmm. um, which I think works better. Yeah, we better. carried that. So the, the one, the two, and the three all have that design. Yeah, so that's... That well, when when a month ago when I got it from him, that was the only way you could get this report with a tapered nut, or that's the only way that you had it packaged on the website. Yeah. was for that lever action one. So okay. he sent me that. Uh, I'm planning on running that. And yeah, it's uh, that's pretty much it. Nice. Are you like not suppressor because of the weight, or you just don't like suppressors? 
Because the ATFs are real slow. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to open up the top? Did you already open up the top of this Tika action the same I'm way? I'm probably not going to cut this one because there's another product that doesn't exist yet that may exist soon that might be real cool to run on a Tika action that's not molested. Okay. You may, you may or may not know about it. You form, mean onto the rail? Form, form knows about it, so I don't know if you guys know about it. Oh, we're talking about Bolt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you're saying that if you Ken, open up the top, the bolt is not going to be... Ken knows about the bolt. If, if I open yeah. up the top of the action, this piece won't won't go there. We got you. Yeah. It won't fit. Interesting. Yeah. You haven't told me about this. This, I'll tell you about this it was literally like, when I came back, I had the information. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Got In the last I know week. things. I know a thing or a thing. I know things. <laughs> We're fixing a problem that's inherent with Tikas. Okay. Hopefully. Yeah, according to you, when we started this Tika build thing, you told me the Tika is perfect. It's pretty much perfect. It is perfect. It's pretty in, close. Unless you it's, have little dick beaters or great big dick beaters, then there's a problem. This okay. is a different problem. Yeah. This is a, this is a different problem than that. All right. Well, let's not forget to talk <laughs> about that. I want to hear about it. <laughs> if that's what you're talking about. Or maybe not. No. Anyways, <laughs> moving on. So so stock, we talked we you said T guys. What is the cartridge? Seven PRC? Seven PRC. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you got uh we shot seven PRCs for the competition. We shot one ninety eight tips and they were three three fifty and three three twenty after load dev. So you'll be limited to three three fifty, correct? Uh as far as I'm just gonna run Sammy length. Mag length, yeah. Three three fifty. Yeah. Um you're gonna shoot like a you have a bullet in, in particular. One eighty LDMs. Okay, so you, you planning on shooting factory ammo? No, no, I got uh, I got stash or reloader twenty six and uh-huh. see how hard I can. You run have brass on. already? Uh, yes, I do. I got fifty pieces of uh, Peterson. Nice. I think. Did you get I'm it here? Did def- you get it here? Because we. Got I didn't. I'm on your. I'm on your emailer list. Well, I, I think. I got a little more money. <laughs> you <laughs> gotta. You gotta know. <laughs> yeah. Well, never mind. <laughs> All right. So what else are you doing? What are you pre-fitting it with? What do you you said a switch barrel? What are you switching gonna switch it to? So I got a, a factory Tika 6.5 PRC barrel as well, because I still like the 6.5 PRC. I don't know. So I'm really eager to shoot the 7 PRC in a hunting weight, like nine and a half pound scoped rifle. Um the 6.5, I can manage recoil well enough to spot all my impacts. Like I love watching the bullet hit. It's the best thing ever. It's it's awesome. So I'm I'm trying to see with that three port big break if I can still watch impacts past 400 in a good shooting position. So if if I can do that, then I'll probably never shoot the six five again, even though I got a stack of bullets for it. But we ordered a neck down seven PRC to six five, Ooh. blown out shoulder, <laughs> and then we plus P it. <laughs> Just to throw you at that's basically the the perfect harmony between your six five and your seven PRC. That's the sweet spot then, isn't it? It, it is. Uh, it's not a six it UM, is. but it's all right. It's not a six UM. So I don't a, know. So it's a six five slash seven I, PRC. I want to shoot as much gun as I can watch impacts with. Mm. Yeah. All yeah. Well you're I cannot with a can, definitely not, with a break like a good break like our TR Pro. Forty percent of the time, fifty percent of the time, I can with a six five PRC, and that's about it. Yeah, sixty so, percent of the time, I'm right. I hundred percent of the time. I spent a lot of time <laughs> talking with Form, and he ran it through some whiz bang hit calculator, and the the, the hit calculator says it, but it says it's better to go to the seven by like five percent. And then talking with him about how I hunt, everything I shoot, I am shooting prone. I have been watching the animal for hours. Usually, I've got a spotting scope with a camera set up on it. Like I am really prepared when I shoot most of the time. You're an ambush guy. I'm an ambush guy. So, like for me, I have the best possible case scenario every time mm-hmm. I shoot almost everything. So, like I'm in a really good shooting position, and that buys me a little bit as far as recoil management for spotting impacts. Because I'm really not like I'm not that exceptional of a shooter. I'm medium average good shooter. But I, I afford myself a lot because I've dry fired on the animal a dozen times. I've I've built up a really sweet shooting position most of the time. So I think for for how I hunt, I think seven PRC is probably max for being able to spot impacts. Is this because you put the mule deer to bed and you're sitting, you know, to. you're up early in the morning, put him in bed, and you watch them all day and wait for him to get up? He's a fucking well, scout. Well, I shoot him in their bed. <laughs> He's a scouting okay. machine. He finds them long before the season. Okay. That's yeah. probably his. Try to. Yeah, I usually know where I'm going to kill it before, the, before opening day. And nice. I'll set up there and wait till the deer steps into where I want to kill him. Wow. Well, I hope one day to be that good. 
he's he's a fucking mule deer guy. They're all weird fuckers, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. he is phenomenal at it. Well, let's get into mule deer because the reason that I think you are exceptional about killing mule deer is you're not. Me and Robbie have talked about this. You're not a one trick pony. Mm. It's I mean you are because it's just mule deer, which is, <laughs> and you guys are a cult. You guys like you like the <laughs> if 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 there was like a equal to you in the outside world, you guys are like a bunch of Mormons, a bunch of fucking cult. <laughs> following people. It's that's the mule deer hunters in the hunting world. We know the word. <laughs> <laughs> you know the word. You guys are different. Like yeah. guys that just hunt mule deer are a different breed. And usually you're pretty successful at killing mule deers and in most of the things in your life you're successful at. I like to think if I wanted to kill elk, I'd be pretty good at it too, but but he'll occasionally send me a picture. He's like, look at this big, stupid bastard. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I could have killed him six times. Yeah. Yeah, I, nice. found, a, I found a couple of elk that elk guys would be real excited to uh-huh. shoot. <laughs> Next time, send us the coordinates. <laughs> oh, he, yeah, he's that one. It was like three or four years ago. He sent me was a that was monster. Big. That was I thought about that one. <laughs> I thought I'm like ah, that's a pretty good bull. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do believe you said you might even get an elk tag. Was that last year, or you did you get an elk tag, or you put in for an elk tag? Um, oh, I've had elk tags. I just I don't hunt them unless I've already killed all my deer tags. But, Fair enough. Yeah. Draw anything good this year so far? Uh, I got a Southern Utah deer tag that I'm pretty excited about. It's a general hunt, but I think there's plenty of good deer on general hunts in Southern Utah. Southern right Utah, now. you got to remind me when we get off because I have some peeps in Southern Utah. Okay, um, but you're not a one trick pony. Like multiple states, you, you're one of the few people besides Robbie that talk about you know hunting timbered bucks, mm-hmm. and you've shot them in the wide open. You've shot them in like you know the desert, high desert. Yeah. And anyways, what is What's made you good at, I guess, the easy parts, the open part, the hard parts, the t- in my opinion, the timber bucks? So I think I think the the thing that matters most, We you know, we were joking about ultralight gear before the podcast started. I don't know mm-hmm. if you're recording that or not, but... We got it all, Dione. The thing, the thing <laughs> that I... I'm a big fan of the process. I love watching mule deer. I love scouting mule deer. I love hunting mule deer. And the, the thing I put all of my effort into early was watching and understanding deer. So I've spent so many days, so many hours watching deer that I feel like I can look at a spot and get a a better than average feel for what the deer are going to want to do in that area, whether or not they're going to like it, whether or not they're going to use certain aspects of it. And I can I can more quickly than the average guy move through country and, and apply the lens of, okay, how are deer going to look at this? Um. And then, you know, once you do that enough and get a certain level of proficiency at it, you can kind of start to apply it other places. And I think that's been the key to any success I've had. Really? Yeah. Just knowing. Covering lots of ground and knowing real quick if there's going to be a deer there. Well, in in, in like a phased approach. So I never go into a place and just start looking for deer. I go into a place and I start looking at everything around me and I'm looking at the country and then from there I break it into smaller pieces. So like, I feel like a lot of guys get hung up. They, they look at Google earth and they find a spot and then, you know, they put all their eggs in that basket and they go look at that spot without the discrimination of like, is this the spot the deer want? They go, they commit to it. And it's like, I get there, but instead of looking at that spot, I'm going to look at everything I can see for as far as I can see. And even though I may have spent a lot of time looking at that spot on Google Earth, if it looks wrong and I see something that looks right, I go to that. Well, how the fuck looks right, Dione? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's an intangible. Like it's, yeah. it's really hard to it's describe. It's a gut the, feeling, right? The buck, the buck I killed last year is, is like the most perfect example of that. So I, I hike into this spot. You got a picture of it on your Instagram? Uh, I could, yeah, I could put one up or I could show you one. I'll put one up uh, before this thing posts. Um, we'll, we'll use that for the picture. Send it to us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I hike into the spot and like, again, I got kids, I got a wife. I'm really limited on scouting time. I, uh, I just finished up a hunt in Wyoming and I had one morning to scout. I literally had one morning. That one. Yep. That little guy. Yeah. That little guy. <laughs> that little guy's nine and a half years old. That little dude's a stud. Um, 21 inch G2 kind of crabby forks, but yeah. So I had one morning. I had to let him walk. I had one morning to scout. (laughs) You would too. We call it the watcher. (laughs) (laughs) I would not let that one walk. 
So I hike, I hike <laughs> into this spot. It's a spot I've looked at for years and, you know, looked at it on the map. I've hunted everything around this spot. Never been into this area. And I get up to this peak. I'm glassing around on the backside. I'm looking at some deer. I literally, I have the morning. I have, I have the morning to scout for deer. That's it. I hiked in. I, go, I, I take off after my kids go to bed at night. I drive into this spot, hiked in at night, get set up, wake up early that morning, looking for deer, see a handful of deer, nothing great. And I'm like, okay, I got an hour or two before I got to be back at the truck. So I'm perched up at this high point and I'm just glassing everything as far as I can see. I got my big 95 millimeter swore on. I'm looking at everything. You know, I, I know there's nothing fruitful to look at for deer. I'm not looking for deer. I'm looking at everything I can see from this vantage point. And I, I've got this hillside I'm looking at two miles away. I'm like, man, that looks really good. Intangible. Can't tell you what made it look good. It looked good. And I'm, I, you know, put the binoculars down pull the 95 millimeter swirl up. <clears throat> it's two miles away. And, and I'm like, God, that looks like a deer. And sure enough, I, you know, zoom in on it. It's a little buck above the, above him. It's like another little buck. And then I'm like, okay, well let's get detailed. And I start looking at the whole hill. I was like, Oh my God, that's, that's a really good buck. You can see frame on a deer at two miles. It's a good deer. Uh huh. And, uh, and I started looking around. It's like, I'm parked below that hill. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 I couldn't, you know, looking at it, on Google Earth, it looks like absolutely nothing. It looks like absolutely nothing. There's there's a trail that goes right at the bottom of that hill, <laughs> and it's so steep that you can't look up from the trail. It's like Cakewalk Trail, really super popular trailhead. And then uh, look, you're looking at the top of it, it's like well, there's so much roll over the top of it. Like you can't glass from the top of it. And then it's got so many little finger ridges coming down it. It's like, well, if you're on that hill, it's so brushy that they'd hear you two or three fingers before you ever saw anything. And oh. I start thinking about it like, that's the perfect situation for a deer. Yeah. Nobody could kill anything on that hill. And it's right by where it's I parked my truck. Plain uh -huh. sight. It's hidden in plain sight. So it's like, you know, here's this spot that I I overlooked and I'm supposedly good at this. And uh and I, I was I was not so confident in my earliest assessment that I I just ruled it out. It's like I I always leave the door open for like what's what's the thing I overlooked? And I, I found it that day. And sure enough, that buck was, you know, it's a phenomenal deer, especially for the last couple of years in that unit. It's been pretty rough going. Talking to the biologist, it's close to single digit buck to doe ratio. Mm -hmm. You know, when they did their count, I think it was at nine bucks per hundred does, which is pretty poor yeah. wow. in that unit. So like found that deer and, uh, and you know, that's late September found that buck. And then I, I go in there opening morning. There's people all over the place. I think it was 13 trucks at the trailhead. Mm. And, uh, and I just said, it's like that trailhead, at that trailhead <laughs> below that hill where that deer lives. And, uh, and I just wow. said, it's like, okay, well, I'm a, I'm a back off of this because that buck's old, that buck's big. He, he knows, he knows, he knows, knows the, the program. Yeah. I'm going to let stuff calm down. Cause there's people crawling all over that hill. So, so multi multiple hunters on that. Hill. You didn't hunt it opening day. I was there watching it. Um, but there's people everywhere. So it's like, okay. I'm going to back off. I'm not going to waste any more time here. That's a big old buck. He knows how to get by these guys. They're not going to figure out his program. So I tell myself, okay, it's, uh, what did it open? It opened the middle of the week. It opened like a Tuesday. This is last. This is last yeah. year. And then yep. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to wait for wait for this whole week. Let opening weekend go by. Middle of next week, I'm going to come in here. And I'm going to kill that deer. So that, that takes a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So opening day, you know, they you always hear it. I say it. Man, if you don't kill it in the first two days, you're not going to kill him. No. Well, he's right though. I mean, it's an old buck. It's lives old on buck. a spot you can't see from got any him, direction. Got him lab. I know now. I didn't know then. I, I figured he was old then, but now I know for a fact he's nine and a half year old deer in unit in Idaho. <laughs> like, oh damn, he even threw down. Well, yeah, everybody hunts this. There's, there's like thirteen thousand people hunt that unit every year. All of Boise. All of fucking Washington and all of Utah, <laughs> fucking cr cram into unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not busting anybody's secret here. Yeah, yeah fucking. So, there's not a fucking safe fork and horn in that whole fucking no. unit. So I tell myself, okay, let's let's pull back, and um, I you know waited out that that week, waited out that next weekend, go back up middle of the next week, bucks right there, right in the middle of the same exact spot oh, where shit. I saw him. Were you up high again? So that's you got a better vantage. That's this the time thing. Closer. You can't kill that deer on the hill he lives on. Oh, so 
I set up across the canyon from him and I told myself, okay, well, everything's got to be really, really right for me to kill this deer. And I set up at what I thought was the closest I could get and still have a vantage on him. And sure enough, a couple minutes after the sun comes up, that deer pops out of a brush pile, set up the spotting scope on him, smoked him at 750. Wow. With a 6.5 PRC? Yep. He's, nice. He survived all those hunters, all those trucks when they were walking right next to Everybody him. Everybody walked right past him. So, you know, all that to say, I feel like the key to my success is is – understanding mule deer and and knowing mule deer and not being so close-minded to think that the thing I thought I I knew when I looked at a map when I go in there I'm still open-minded to the things I missed and and I took a, a critical evaluation of everything around me to see what I had missed and to see if there was something better that I'd overlooked and it was fruitful mm-hmm. would the 25 year old Dione done that God no <laughs> No, <laughs> no, no. I was I was a tryhard when I was twenty five. I was a tryhard. I didn't know any better, but I worked at it. And in the mm. early twenty tens, you could get away with that. Yeah, there was a lot more deer. That's interesting. So that buck wasn't was he in the timber or was he in a wide open? And just a wide open brushy hillside brushy with a handful hillside. of trees on it. Interesting. I was looking in the timber. Well, if people well, flame if we don't ask you. So, what is your setup for like optic wise? What your mule deer hunting? So I've got a 95 millimeter STX. I've got a 65 objective on it. Uh, and I've got 10 by 42 NL peers. And then I've also got uh, an STS 65 that uh, that I use when I want to go lighter. Do you ever use it? Yeah. Sometimes. Really? Yeah. Every now and again. Man. The new little guy is pretty badass. The new little guy is pretty badass. I got one on the store over there. Yeah. I like those. Yeah. They're really good for digiscoping. I like that little Kawa 55, too. I, I think, might pick up a straight one of those and get rid of the STS. But man, I don't know, because I that love fucking Swarovski, Kawa though. next to the, F, the little... I should have known. Oh, it's, look, it's like looking through a toilet paper tube. It, the Swaro is not a little Swaro. The Swaro is phenomenal. The Kawa is like looking through a toilet paper tube. Yeah. But it's still lighter, and if all you need to do is verify <laughs> something that you're looking at... Like for me, it's 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 like the rifle I was telling you about. Like this is the rifle I pack instead of a pistol. Mm-hmm. Um, the cow is the spotting scope I pack instead of nothing. This is the new and approved Dione. The other one would just be packing around a BTX all season. Yeah, I've done that a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> that ninety five special hurts. though. Yeah. That ninety five special. Like you can see stuff that just you. There's the nothing else that like one fifteen. But and I I. Uh, I, I picked up the uh, Kawa 88 mm-hmm. from uh, SNS Archery and friends with those guys. They let me take one home and play with it for the weekend. And the field of use better, no question. The field of use better, but for absolute resolution, I don't think anything's better than a 95. I would agree. And I'm Kawa makes a great product. Yeah, it's just my eye loves Swarovski. And I, I love there. I love their fine focus on the Kawa. But it just feels fragile compared to the Swarovski, and I am not nice to my stuff. That's is it, Kawa or Koa? I don't know, Koa, I, Kawa. I, don't know. I say it both it's ways. Kua, Kua. <laughs> this is a guy that says fucking Bino Highness, Bino, <laughs> Bino Highness, Bino Harness. Oh, uh, the uh, have you fucked around that sixty six Koa yet? Yes, I have. Which thoughts compared to the ATS sixty five? Ah, uh, so it's good. It's it's really good. I, I wish I'd have had it in a different circumstance to get a good feel for the field of view because the, the, the cow is they got phenomenal field of view. I don't think for absolute image resolution it's better than the ATX or the STX. I don't think it is. It's funny because when you and, and I don't I always take any kind of optics review with a grain of salt because you're fucking adding another lens to the to yeah. the party. Everybody's and got your, their eyeball. Yeah, your lens is gonna be different than my lens and his lens is gonna be in his eyes. So you're adding an additional lens. But I don't know how many times I've looked through something and somebody's told that knows what they're talking about. They told me what they see. I'm like, oh, I don't see that. I, I see yeah. a blue or I see a yellow or I see warm, you know, or I see cold. So you you have to look through it yourself mm-hmm. to know if you're gonna like it or not. Yeah, and it's it's phenomenal. Don't get me wrong. I had it next to an ATX and STX, uh, STS sixty five HD with a twenty five to fifty, and then I had that that new Kawa. Um, I think it was pre production, so I don't know how critical. Some of the pre production stuff's not always as good, but it was really good. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think it was better. 
one reason early on I had a 77 and after one hunting season, I had dented that fucker up so bad because they have that, it's aluminum. They don't have like that rubberized coating like most optic companies have. And I was like, well, I can't until they come out. Like, I don't want to buy a fucking case mm -hmm. for my optics. So I've, since then I've well, and used them again. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the newer one, so they did a revision on the 88 and it's magnesium housing now. Magnesium or aluminum, but it's exposed, like anodized. Yeah, it's, it's exposed. Yeah. But, and I may also be wrong in this. I think it might've been you that told me it, or if it was, it might've been uh, Evan at Swaro. So Swaro quit making the magnesium bodied spotting scope because they had issues with them when they would get really hot. If somebody left them in a truck, yes. they would purge. But they would lose their purge. They would lose their, yes. their uh, nitrogen. I don't so. know if he told that. That's what I've heard from them. So I mean, we may just be spreading rumors. Doesn't matter. Mm. I like that too. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard the same thing. We don't thing need from the multiple. facts here. We have our own. <laughs> yeah. If we're lying, but. just fucking let us know. You always do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I've heard that from multiple people. Yeah. So I think so that, that is true. That was kind of because I was ready to buy that 88 too. Um, like I'm, I'm addicted to optics, but. Um, that was concerning when I found out that that was magnesium. If Swaro decided it was worthwhile to cut the magnesium stuff because it had durability issues, it's like, probably avoid that. Mm. I would agree. I Like I said, you can fact check us, but that's what I've heard too. Yeah. So obviously you're carrying on the, the gear side of XO backpack, I'm, yep. I'm assuming. Anything weird? Is there something weird that Dione carries that nobody else carries? Hmm. Nothing probably too weird. Um, carry a rear bag anytime I'm hunting, just because I'd rather I'd rather shoot good than have a light backpack. And you're 100 yeah. percent in the prone. You said in your last. I, mean, I can't remember the last thing I shot that wasn't in the prone. Man, I respect that. Sometimes it takes work. I think it's harder the other way. I hate being surprised when I'm about to shoot something. So, um, a lot of coffee. A lot of coffee. A lot of coffee. <laughs> oh, I was just seeing, uh, I seen, uh, what's the stuck in the road? Adam Grinda. Mm -hmm. He just posted this thing where you, you know, how they Sucked. have the, oh, so, you know, they put the nicotine pouches or whatever mm -hmm. kind of pouches mm -hmm. you put in your lip. Well, now there's a 200 milligram caffeine pouch. That's all Ooh. it is is caffeine. I could sign up for something. And it's like, like that. wintergreen or something. You put it right in your lip and fucking hit the trail. You ever yeah. snorted Coke? Coke? <laughs> it's just as fast. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. I'm fucking kidding. I almost answered. A quaalude. There was a <laughs> quaalude. I think that goes the other way. Oh. <laughs> ever seen, you ever seen the Wolf of Wall Street? Dude, uh, it's, no, ridiculous. it's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, was, it had a delay. It kicked in. It was a delay. <laughs> a delay. <Kicked> in. <laughs> Whenever he's trying to get out of his car. <laughs> you, gotta, you ever seen that show? No. You got to watch. So so yeah. we're going to watch That's on my movie list? You got to watch Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> okay. You'll this never... is with Leonardo DiCaprio. Yep. Quaaludes, And dude. the Barbie. The okay. new Barbie. Yeah. Gotta what's her, what's her name? I may have slept. I don't know. I've slept since then. You have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a horrible memory. <laughs> yeah, but I thought, I mean, I'm a, I'm a coffee guy, too, so we, uh, I drink a Starbucks. Uh -huh. But now they call it shaken espresso. It used to be called a double shot. But basically a venti, Starbucks, shaken espresso, and we add a shot, so it's five shots total. And then I drink that every morning. So when we're up in the mountains, there ain't nothing that touches that. Oh, man, I, saw I, got, the, I got a good recipe. Do you? I do the Folgers packets, which a lot of people give me a hard time over. Okay. But I also take, uh, I think it's a Cliff Energy, like a gel. Uh -huh. They have a mocha flavored gel with 50 milligrams extra caffeine. Okay. And if you mix that in, stir it up, it's like a creamer. It's oh, it's amazing. Okay. It's amazing. Nice. I can, I can, I love coffee so much. I can distinctly remember <laughs> the first time I had coffee in the back country, and I'm sitting there just jackhammer and freezing. This is early early 2010s before like cool backpacking hunting gear existed, and I'm just freezing. And I'm sitting on the side of the mountain glassing for mule deer, and I, I like I just bought a jet boil, and I just found those Folgers pockets. First time I've ever used it. And I'm sitting there and make a cup of coffee, and I take a sip of that coffee. And it just feels like a warm hug from my mom. Nice. <laughs> it's like everything's good now. Uh -huh. Everything's good now. Hell yeah. Dude, nothing warms you up. Uh. Like from the inside, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the song? What? What's the Folgers? Isn't there like this Folgers part of jingle? Up, no, Folgers like, yeah, the cup. best yeah. part of waking up. <laughs> Uh, I had the crappiest <laughs> gear. I had like a 40 degree sleeping bag and it was like 20 degrees that night. I'm wearing oh. everything you got. Just. Man, I, I'm grateful for it though, because like I look at I look at guys now and they're so so spoiled. We got such nice gear now. It's so easy to be comfortable. 
Mm-hmm. I was broke too. College kid bought everything used off Craigslist. Yeah, and mm. there's there's even good cheap gear. Yeah, you know? it's we're lucky. We live in the golden age of backcountry gear. Yes, it's we only do. getting better too. It's getting it it's is. getting so too much good. competition. Too fucking easy. It's getting too good. Yeah. So would you rather have more days scouting or more days in the field hunting? You don't need a whole lot of days in the field hunting if you scout right. So most of my hunts, I'll even go before the hunt starts. If it's an out-of-state hunt, I've, I try and plan most of my out-of-state hunts somewhere where I can scout too. So there's probably better hunts in most of the states I'm hunting that I could get with my points. But a lot of the places I, I apply, I apply because they're close enough for me to drive to. Mm-hmm. Um and then on top of that, when I when I get ready to go hunt, I'll plan I'll plan some of my vacation time before the hunt starts, because if I got a deer found before anybody else shows up and I can get him killed opening morning, I don't need as many days on the back end. Nice. Last question for me. I don't know if Jake has any. Would you rather shoot a two hundred inch typical or a one ninety six trashy motherfucker? Typical, every time. Interesting. Yeah, I'm a little trashy. I'd, I'd, I'd rather shoot f- a 190 typical than a, than oh, a 200 inch trashy non-typical. fucker every time. Yeah, I've got, I don't know. I got enough little trashy cheater bucks. I like clean typicals. I, I thought you'd go the other way, Joni. No, really thought you would. No, nope, I don't. Would you? That way. Let me ask you this: Would you take a 183 point or a 190 typical? A 190 typical. God, Buck I killed a couple years ago was 179 as a three point. Would, three would four, you take but. a four hundred inch bull or a hundred eighty inch buck? I got a lot of one eighties. <laughs> I'd probably <laughs> shoot that bull. So for years, I've threatened my buddies. Like anytime I find a really big bull, I'll send I'll send a bunch of my buddies that are elk hunters. I'll send them a picture of it and be like, "It's almost big enough. If I killed this one, I could talk shit to you for the rest of my life and never have to hunt elk again." <laughs> it's I almost see, big enough. I can see you doing that. You just post it. I'm fucking done with elk hunting with this big freaking bull. That's what I'm waiting for. That's what I found some pretty special bulls. I, you know, I may or may not have been able to actually kill any of them, but that doesn't matter when I'm talking shit to my buddies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, if I find if I find a really, really, really special bull, I may dedicate some time to to trying to kill him just so I can never have to do that again. I lied. I got one more question. Why are you going? I understand your process. You kind of explained it. Why are you going to a seven PRC from a six five PRC? Is it solely ballistics? Just cheat the wind. Like I said, I'm not that good at shooting. <laughs> I want to. I want to afford myself as much margin of error as I possibly can for not calling the wind right. Have you ever seen the specs on a six UM? They're pretty good. They're pretty good. Seven still beats it in the wind, though. You were like you a used car ballistics. salesman. I did. What you what velocity you put in? I am like a used car salesman. You what velocity did you put in? I spent. I spent like. So I was working out of town one night, and I called up for him. He has a tendency to talk long like I do, too. We spent like two hours on the phone. He was running through it all with his calculator. And the the 6UM for sure beats it, in your case, where you had that buck that you couldn't get a good distance on. And yeah. he's like, you could have held from 500 to 700 on this deer and had the elevation right, but right. the 7 beats it for wind. What velocity did you put in for the room, or for the UM? I can't remember. He did it. Oh, mm-hmm. for him. Him, you probably fucking lied to him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had him put 3,000 for the seven. What barrel length on the seven? Yeah, I'm going 24. What barrel length on the UM? I don't remember. 20 since then. Oh. Well, I'm be running that shit tonight. I'll be sending you shit. <laughs> <laughs> what bullet? 180 ELDM. Oh, that's a hard. They misnamed to them too, man. Hornady's really missing the ball with with marketing that bullet. They should call it the ELD murder. Yes. <laughs> they are the most wicked bullet I've ever seen. Yeah. They're that, just so violent. That bullet is a bullet I argue about the most. I don't know how many calls. Like that bullet is the bullet that gets brought up that won't kill. That I've actually seen outside of a 215 burger i've seen more death with an eldm than any other bullet Man, especially I've, like the 140 so like there are specific yeah. eldms that we hear like well, 147 147 108 to 180 225 225s they're just fucking murdering machines it's so violent man i've i've never seen i've never seen animals re- react as dramatically as shooting with that bullet well and i was like well you can't shoot them i we back to back me and tanya shot fucking bulls under 80 yards through the shoulder with a 147 what more do you want, people? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they work. It's like five sixty-five and H one thousand may be a bit better than your twenty-six. You think so? If you were going to use your twenty-six, I would do 
I would take when you when you get your load somewhat figured out before you go too crazy with it. Just mm-hmm. take a few rounds, put it in a in a koozie bag with some eighteen hour hot hands, hundred okay, degrees yeah. Fahrenheit, and then put a few rounds in a cooler and check your check your temp range. <laughs> I mm-hmm. busted some Your primers. I, I did it on my 6.5 Pierce C, and it wasn't that bad, but I didn't, you know, I was like 85 on the high end. Okay. And then uh, on the 85 low end, 85 yes. degrees. Oh. Do you know what your feet per second per degree Fahrenheit was, your variance? Mm, per degree, no. Per degree, no. I, well, when I think you work it out, basically, like a, if you get somewhere around a – Anything down by a point one or a point two or a point three, that's phenomenal. Yeah, the, the Hoshin Extreme is for sure better. Yes. And the 565 is really temp stable, but it's pretty hard on a barrel, isn't it? It's more so than the 26. Actually, fi- 565 is less caustic than 570 is. Mm, very yeah, Applied much. Ballistics. Brian Liz, I guess, did some tests where they shot 2,000, 3,000 rounds through two, comparing 565 <laughs> to 570. Yeah. He was actually using 565 in his Norma when he won that Night Force ELR challenge Okay. with the 245s. So I was planning on trying Reloader 26. I've got 4831 Shortcut and H1000. Yeah. Um, I'll go H1000 first. Yeah, you think so? You, they can correct you me if I'm wrong. You a 30-inch barrel on your comp guns, though, weren't you? We yeah, did. We did. Long. How was it out of a 24? Well, we haven't we done have super short yet, but it was interesting because out of the two the two rifles were identical. I mean, the, the two barrels were cut from the same rod of steel, one mm-hmm. after another. Everything was literally identical. Headspace was perfect to the thousandth. And they one liked 565, one hated H1000, one liked H1000 and hated 565. Hmm. But they were super similar on their actual load, the charge. Yeah, so right around 68 grains, they were nearly identical velocities, which was pretty cool. Yeah, so the two rifles shot, we were, we were what was it, like 1,100 yards. They had a, a shot marker at the Night Force ELR Challenge, mm-hmm. and we shot, so both rifles, five shots each. Mm-hmm. We were like one M away of each other. You know, at, the, at a target that far, so it's pretty cool. But so I got a couple questions. So, so first okay. question will be, what is your absolute favorite thing to eat in the backcountry? Ooh, Slim Jims. We just did. We just did. <laughs> when, when, like when I'm just when I'm hiking or when no I'm matter. Hiking? It doesn't matter what it, it could be. A fucking gummy bear if that was your favorite. What yeah, is your gummy, fucking go to? Your good. favorite. <laughs> your absolute favorite thing. Your favorite um, lickies and chewies. Favorite lickies and chewies. Uh Man, I've been I've been pretty big on the uh, on the gummy worms lately, but uh, my absolute That's a favorite fucking texture thing for me, man. I <laughs> wish it, I could do the, te- the texture like, fucks me up. Like gummy bears too. Or? Yeah, anything gummy really? with that texture, it could be like a like a, like ju- not juicy fruit, uh, jujube, like things like that, like that you can squish right through it. But yeah. when you get the when it rebounds, when I bite, <laughs> when it has resistance, when I bite, there's a fucking rebound. I You're can't overthinking do it. this. Yes, <laughs> but just, probably like for actual hunting, I really like those Tillamook pepperoni sticks. Oh, those are good too. They're really? good. Okay, they're good. Like we talk, again, are we talking sour or are we just straight? Is it? I don't know. Whichever ones they sell at Winco. Like the, like the Hasbro's, bag. like the Hasbro's yeah. gummy bears, the, the most standard gummy bears. Yeah, Haribo. I think it's not Hasbro. I don't give a fuck. That's a, that's a toy company. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're chewing on Legos. Here we go. Don't give a fuck. Hasbro or, or what did you say? Hari- I think it's Haribo. Haribo or oh, Hasbro. Dude, there was an H and a fucking O, and I just kind of <laughs> under dashy line. Yes, it was under yes. lower squishy, lower, squishy, <laughs> lower hashy. Oh shit! We just did a backcountry food and and water thing. That's why I brought that up. And yeah. then the next question would be: What is your single favorite piece of gear in the backcountry? Could be anything. Oh, that's gotta be my big spot and scope. Yeah, yeah. That's such a. It's a BTX. Uh, so I, I run the STX most. Okay, time. that's yeah. just such a big. How much does it weigh? I don't even know. It doesn't matter. I don't weigh it. it doesn't matter. Come, come it doesn't matter. matter. What? Something pounds. It's uh, man. It's just. It's there's there's so many things that you can pack that'll make you more comfortable, but so few things that you can pack that'll make you more successful. Yeah. What, what I think is funny about mule deer hunters, and I don't mean to harp on you, fucking weirdos, but. <laughs> A sheep hunter will fucking go to the nth degree, and they got to count rings, right? Oh yeah, and they'll and they'll take sixty fives. I'm sure some do take. It's very not a lot. I know quite a few sheep hunters. You do too. Not a lot are packing one ninety or ninety fives around. Mm-hmm. No sheep hunting, mule deer hunters. You can get in some very sheep country hunting mule deer's, mm-hmm. and they'll fucking pack around a one fifteen or a ninety five. Mm-hmm. They don't give a fuck. I think a lot of it, to, to give sheep hunters a little bit of credit, I think a lot of it's weight limitations on an airplane. That could be. That could. So but I mean, the guys I know that, that like do it, do it. It's a weight limitation on an airplane. The guys I know that hunt sheep in Idaho, they pack a big scope. Like what did uh, 
Steve Pack a few years ago, last year with his oh, big that guy's That guy's obsessed with lightweight stuff. No. So he doesn't count? No, he doesn't count. He doesn't count. He gets a pass. <laughs> I don't I don't make fun of him for being lightweight because he kills stuff. But Oh, I, I mean, it's a personal thing. I just find it funny that mule deer hunters will pack some fucking optics. Like you, Brady Miller, pack some optics to yeah. kill shit. Fuck, Brady's packing around a 15-pound freaking rifle. Yeah. Well, and you need a serious tripod to run that, too. Like, you, you got to think everything's got to go... You know, accordingly, like you can't pack an ultralight tripod and make good with a ninety-five. So you got to pack mm-hmm. some serious stability. That new, uh, that new Tricer tripod is mm-hmm. the same weight as like a slick six thirty-four. Yeah, and it had it a pretty nice little head. I think they ripped off that head though. What, what was the? Oh, yeah, was, well, the, they kind of ripped off Wiser. Wiser, Wiser in my opinion, Wiser is a better head. Yeah, you know? and I do like the fact it's made in America. That's my opinion. But the Tricer is fine. I just don't. When I lock it up, when we were at the shoot. When I locked it up, and it it would move in the in the wiser wood. I, I was talking about the tripod though. So without the, oh, not yeah, talking yeah. about the head, mm-hmm. the new tripod. tripod they come out with says it'll hold, I think twenty six pounds. There's for almost the same weight as what the slick is. There's a wild discrepancy in different companies' weight ratings. Yeah. So like if you look at Sure and their weight rating, and you look at uh, Slick and their weight rating, the actual stability on the Slick. You talking about Sarui? Sarui, yeah, Syru. <laughs> <laughs> we fuck. We are, so if we you look at the actual, words, so I, miss. I have I have a Sure, I have it's like I've had twenty different tri, uh, twenty different tripods probably, but um, the actual stability for a slick that's rated way lighter than the Surui, Sure, Siru, whatever you want to call Bino, it, Bino, Bino, Hasbro, ha- uh, Hagerman. The stability on the slicks better with a lighter weight rating, so yeah. it's it's it's. Made up numbers yeah. on, on a piece of paper I to sell more tripods. Store, but fucking with that tricer is interesting because it reminds me of like if you take a Leo photo yeah. against the same diameter tubes of a uh, RSS, mm-hmm. or really right stuff, whatever that is. RRS. RRS. It, there's like, they're different. The carbon, like you're saying, yeah. the, there's not as much spring back. There's not as bouncy. They're yeah, way so stiffer. If you look, um, I was, I, I geeked out on it. I've slept since then. But uh, so like, Slick and their like 88 series, they have, I want to say, seven layers of carbon. And then uh, if you look at Surui, Surrey, whatever, depending on which line, they'll go from like five layers of carbon to up to 11 layers of carbon, I want to say. So, you know, you can't just go off of leg diameter. Like leg diameter doesn't mean rigidity. No. And there's some argument for some of the aluminums because like, you can get an aluminum tripod and they're they're more rigid and in some cases they may seem more stable but then if you get into situations like the wind you'll have more dampening on a carbon mm-hmm. so it's man there's a lot there's a lot of variability that can go into which is actually going to be more stable for the circumstances you're using it in which tripod do you use right now so i i'm either packing a slick 80 88 i think 883 or the sure 124 and then i've got sure uh vh5 heads on both of them it's the five or the 10 VA, i can't remember va5 VA VA yeah. yeah it's a long uh, stem handle yeah that's a heavy yeah head. but you can cut or you can yeah. take that handle take off and off. put a little carbon fiber tube in it but what i like about that regardless of which spotting scope i'm running i really really like the salmon river solutions uh arca picatinny rail so I run an Atlas bipod, and then I can clip it into any of my tripods. And, and I like being able to shoot off a tripod because there's a lot of situations where you can't get prone. And if you can cross your trekking poles on the back of your gun and stick what? the front of it in a tripod, you are so stable. Wait, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. You just said that 99% of your fucking shots are He just prone. wants to be prepared. I want to be ready for the one I ready. can't get prone on. There you we're go. back to a 6UM. There you go. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> See, well, I did that. I will shoot just as far <laughs> off of my tripod with trekking poles crossed up under the back of it as I will off a of prone. We it's uh, so stable. We shot a whole bunch, and we just came back from shooting. We did a podcast on it. We shot a whole bunch with our packs and sticks. Mm. Unbelievable how far you can shoot. Unreal how far you can shoot like that. Stable. Yeah. Mm. But I guess I proved my point. You need a six UM. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Any I'm more questions for it. you? You're doing good. Jake, Jake's usually I'm in bed by now. I'm, hit, I'm hitting the He's wall right now. He looks I'm, hit, I'm, I'm hitting the wall right now. I'm proud of our little buddy. It's past yeah. nine. Yes, thank the, you. The witching hour, and he thank is you. still freaking Dude, hammering. It's fucking well. It's 930. It is well past nine. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a fucking break. <laughs> I mean, if you round up a little. Anything, anything else? All good, man. You, it's any, nice to meet you. Appreciate you coming on. Any parting shots? 
Uh, nothing, nothing too crazy. No. From now on, you're getting your gunsmithing from unknown munitions. Is yeah, that what I heard. <laughs> good with that. <laughs> All right, uh, get a hold of us at podcast at shoot dot com. Remember, it's shoot two the number two hunt dot com, and you can find us on Instagram at shoot to hunt. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.